Great, thank you everyone for coming today. Um, I'm Joyce Briggs and I'm president of the Alliance for Contraception in Cats and Dogs. I know that none of us uh, might have imagined a month ago that we would be in this webinar together. Um, thank you for your hard work and resiliency. Things are changing quickly and history will judge how we've managed big challenges and found opportunities within them. I am pleased to have gathered a really solid cast of experts today to talk to you about the possibilities we are offering for consideration. For those that don't know me, I've worked in animal welfare for over 25 years and spay neuter has been a real passion. I've focused on popularizing pediatric neutering, high volume spay neuter models and on effective TNR. For the last 14 years, I've worked actively on non-surgical sterilization to help us reinvent global access to fertility control. Access that really evades too many cats and dogs right now. The progress on that front is substantial, but much like drug discovery and development, it's slow. I am very excited about having a permanent sterilization in seven to 10 years from now, but that's another webinar and it won't help us right now. As the pandemic has unfolded, many of you are faced with the immediate need to stop surgical spaying and neutering for what we hope is confined to a matter of months, but right now uh, when cat spays are so critical. And what we'll describe today is not a silver bullet, but we believe it's a pretty functional band-aid right when it's needed most. Um, we feel this stopgap measure deserves consideration until you can spay once more, depending on the risk benefit equation for the cats you're working with. I am really pleased to have doctors Mike Greenberg and Julie Levy with me today to tell you about this option. They are both highly credentialed and experienced in shelter medicine and how we work with animals at the most risk of producing unwanted litters. Uh, they are gonna divide up sharing information about this contraceptive and will incorporate their perspectives on scenarios, risks, and benefits. I am equally grateful to have Dr. Michelle Kutzler and Dr. Linda Rhodes with us. They have deep expertise in small animal reproduction and regulatory parameters for using products compounded for animals. They'll round out the panel to answer your questions and add their thoughts. Um, I don't know if you're able to see them on your Zoom camera, but um, we are real pleased to have them with us. So as of this morning, this webinar had over 1,100 signups. And this graph, yes, please, this graph shows you the makeup of our audience. We are really pleased by the diversity. Um, we're pleased to have so many veterinarians and staff with us. Together, 38%. Um, uh, um, another 30% of shelter rescue staff, and then volunteers, pet owners, and others, many from national organizations make up the important rest of you. Um, I know we have some international guests with us and this will be admittedly a fair bit US focused, but hopefully helpful for you as well. I encourage you to see the specific outside US statement on ACCND's website. Um, I'm gonna keep this in an interview format that I'll first be, and I'll first be turning to Julie, but before I do, we're gonna do a really quick poll to get a better sense of this audience as we try to share um, the information. So poll, please. You should see this pop up on your screen. Um, and I'm gonna read this for the sake of the folks on the recording who may not get to see it. So the first question is, do you, your organization serve shelter cats, own cats, community or TNR cats, or other not applicable? Um, and please check all that, all that apply. The second question is, is your organization or provider continuing to do routine cat spays now? You can check yes, no, that you have reduced availability, but some, or not applicable. And I'll leave it to our webinar guru, Allison, to help us um, start showing the results here in a few minutes, in a, in a few seconds, and see what we have, and I'll review that for you. All right, really helpful. So 72 of, of the total responses, 72% um, of you are involved with shelter cats, 68% um, involved with owned cats, 83% of you involved in some way with community or TNR cats, um, and about 10% other are not applicable. And in terms of is your organization or providing continuing to do routine cat spays, we're hearing only 8% of you say yes, 63% say no, 
22% are showing a reduced availability, but some um, and 7% not applicable. So it shows that an awful lot of you are in this situation to be looking at what do you do in this gap. So I'm going to conduct this in kind of like an interview format. And first, I'll be turning to Julie. Um, um, so Julie, you've been working with national leaders to help develop guidance for shelters and clinics since the beginning of the COVID pandemic in the US. Why don't you tell us about the current status of shelter operations and spay neuter programs? Certainly, Joyce, and thank you for that, that great summary of where we are now. For those of you who know me, I have been working on spay neuter research and training for 30 years. And it breaks my heart that I recommended to the program that I started to TNR Cats in Gainesville that we suspend our operations um, nearly a month ago at the beginning of the pandemic. This is one of our caregivers. Uh, she's an older woman, definitely in the a risk group for for severe complications if she were to become infected and her colony cats are her family they're very important to her so it is critical that we support people like her and her cats and our staff in closing down our shelter operations right now now we still are delivering food and we've developed uh, ways that we can do this very safely to support our caregivers But this is really why we need to roll back on our routine spay neuter activities. This is a doctor who works in an ER in a human hospital, and it's been several weeks since he's been home to see his family, but he can't even really see his family when he comes home because he knows he's contaminated and been exposed to the virus. And his wife posted this Facebook post pleading with people to stay home so their family could be back together. These are the maps that I, I pulled off today from the models. These, uh, this map of the US shows where all the cases are that have been diagnosed so far, almost a half a million cases that have spread rapidly across the country in the past few weeks and over 16,000 deaths. And this curve below it is the most optimistic model of the trajectory of this pandemic. There are, this one shows um, hospital beds that are needed and ventilators that are needed over time. It suggests that we are peaking right now and that if everybody keeps sheltering in place and restricting their activity, that we may be back to kind of a low rumble of spread by the beginning of June. So, but that is very, very dependent on us staying home and only being out for essential services. These, initially when people were talking about how to control spread of the pandemic, there was recommendations around if you were sick or febrile, but since then it's been shown that up to half of people who are shedding virus are not sick at the time, and that's probably what allowed it to spread so quickly. Julie, I'm sorry, this is Linda Rhodes. Could you fix your screen? It's showing uh, two slides at once. It's not in the presenter mode. Mm. Sorry about that. How's this? Perfect. Okay, thanks for speaking up, Linda. Um, so this is, we've been working with a number of national committees now that have um, been working with shelters to cause, uh, to help them navigate switching to emergency services only. And these are the main topics that we've been coaching shelters on is what defining the critical functions that they have as well as um, helping them preserve those as their staffing plummets due to infection and exposure of their staffs, suspending all of the other non-emergency functions. And these are the two topics that we're really talking about today is what are critical functions and what are the non-emergency functions. Shelters are also um, essentially evacuated their current shelter populations so that staff could stay home and also to, so they can save room for taking care of emergencies as well as for the influx of animals from COVID exposed homes that we are starting to see happen now. Um, and this means that we have suspended our routine neuter before adoption policies. And so thousands and thousands of intact cats and dogs have flooded into adoptive homes and to foster homes, many of whom have never fostered before, and those are with agreements to neuter the pets later. So this is a very unfamiliar territory for us. 
At the same time, we want uh, shelters to evacuate. We don't want them to use euthanasia as a tool for reducing population. And we're also developing policies on how shelters can handle COVID exposed animals that are coming in. So the critical functions are quite a short list. This is uh, law enforcement assistance, picking up injured and sick strays, cruelty and neglect complaints, dangerous dogs, and protective custody. And those might be the animals that are coming from homes where people have been hospitalized or died, or um, potentially like domestic violence homes. On the left side, I have some quotes that I think have been especially poignant from shelter directors during this time. And this actually was from the mayor of San Jose. He said, the time for half measures is over. History will not forgive us for waiting an hour more. And so what are the non-emergency functions that are, they are essential and they're important, but they're not emergency. So non-aggressive stray pickup, all of the complaints, uh, nuisance complaints, uh, trapping and transporting of community cats, and heartbreaking for us was the suspension of public spay, neuter, and wellness clinics. So here's an example of a very clear directive from the New Jersey Medical, Veterinary Medical Association that told us how we should decide if a procedure is an emergency. And this is in their executive order. They said, is this procedure necessary to save an animal's life, to alleviate pain and suffering, to prevent a zoonotic disease? Could it be managed in a way that mitigates risk? Does it require the use of scarce resources needed for critical human medical care, or could this patient safely wait until resources are less scarce and human risks are lower? And this is where I think someone said it best. Is this a procedure that you would take an animal to an emergency clinic after hours for? And if not, then we can probably put it on hold. So this is where the, the heartburn happens is spay neuter doesn't make the cut on being an emergency procedure other than dystocias and pyometras. Uh, this means we had to pause most of our neuter before adoption and send animals home with agreements, stop our trap neuter return programs right at the beginning of kitten season, uh, and to push all of these animals that are already in shelters out to the public. Uh, states have been asked to temporarily exempt shelters from neuter before adoption laws and also to replace a lot of the normal face-to-face -face care we would do with telemedicine. So in the, the end result of this is that thousands of intact cats have been placed in foster homes and community cat programs are suspended right now when most of the cats are pregnant. And this is a quote from a shelter director who said, we were making fantastic strides and this is a gut punch to me um, because they had started their TNR program last year and it had really had a huge impact on reducing shelter intake. So I know this is very distressing for all of those who have been working so hard in spay neuter, but I can promise you the national groups are already working together to come up with a plan so that when we emerge on the other side of this pandemic in a few months, that we will come back bigger and better than ever before. We will have higher capacity, more efficiency, more funding, and that we will catch up and then some. And this is a picture of a model that is really inspiring. It's a spayathon for Puerto Rico. And this particular clinic actually at their peak spayed more than 700 cats and dogs in a single day. So with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Mike to continue. Yeah, thanks a lot, Julie. Mike, there are an unprecedented number of intact female cats in new homes right now. And as Julie mentioned, TNR programs for community cats are right at the beginning of kitten season. What's this? Tell us about the option for oral contraception in female cats. Sure. Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, uh, magisterial acetate here um, as a possible, you know, adjunct to spaying female cats uh, during this crisis. And I'm just going to kind of go over what what it is, what it can do, um, and you know, some of the potential benefits, limitations, things like that. Um, one of the things I want to drive home here is this word adjunct. Um, we are not uh, really talking here about a, you know, all out replacement and either or. I always like to think about um, these options as tools in the toolbox. Very often in uh, sterilization, we think about a single tool, um, surgical sterilization. Um, but I think it's uh, in a time like this and other times too, it's worth, to th uh, worth it to think about um, other tools as well. So um, let's just talk 
uh, briefly without getting uh, too bogged down. Um, I know all of our veterinarians and folks in the audience might have a little bit of a heart palpitation looking at these um, pictures, picture one on the left, but um, what is it? Uh, Megestrel acetate, I'll probably just say MA, is a synthetic progestin. Um, and in short, it helps to stop ovulation um, by affecting what's called uh, luteinizing hormone, LH and uh, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone. Um, and it thickens the, uh, the uterine lining. We'll, we'll leave it there for now, but um, it's a synthetic progestin that has uh, action in a couple different places. Um, certainly has actions throughout the body because it is a steroid, um, steroid analog, I should say. Um, how is it used? How is it, you know, where is it available? So in cats, we should be really clear, it's, uh, it's not registered, it's not FDA approved um, in cats for this indication. So this would be an, an off-label uh, use uh, for sure. Uh, obviously, veterinarians are used to using things off-label. Um, and, and it's been used off-label for fertility control in cats for, you know, for a long, long time. Uh, in dogs, it is FDA approved uh, as a drug called uh, Ovaban uh, for postponing estrus, for uh, postponing heat in dogs. Um, so there it is, uh, it is approved. And just, um, you know, put it in there. It, it, it's used in people uh, to treat all sorts of other things, um, but it's no longer used for uh, any sort of fertility control in, in people. Um, you can get it uh, outside the U.S., uh, it has it has other indications and things like that, but again, as Joy said, um, we are focusing on the on the U.S. use here. Certainly, if you're um, coming here from another country, uh, check with your local laws, regulations, things like that. Available formulations. Uh, this drug is, uh, with the exception exception of uh, you know Ovaban, is is as we said for dogs, uh, and that always comes as a pill. Um, it's commercially available. Um, when we're talking about MA, magestral acetate for cats, it's, uh, it's gonna generally be a compounded uh, formulation uh, of this drug. And it does require a prescription. Uh, you have to just get it from a veterinarian. Uh, we've looked into this a little bit and you know, uh, really found that a liquid version of this compound is less expensive. And I think that all of us who have dealt with cats um, would agree that that you know liquids tend to just be easier. You can flavor them. Cats, um, you know, they tend to figure out what's in that wet food, no matter how well you mix it and how stinky that wet food is. I think um, all of our trappers in the audience can probably uh, attest to that. Um, we the compounders we've talked to uh, often say about 180 day shelf life. That asterisk next to there is. Um, as we're going to say throughout this, you know, talk to your compounder um, about about what they offer. Since these drugs are, you know, compounded when you order them, there's there's going to be different uh, specifics there. But those are some of the numbers that we found. Um, you can get it compounded in different formula, uh, different concentrations um, because of the dosing that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, Ten mg per mil seems to be about you know a sweet spot. It results in you know about of a, about a quarter of a mil per um, kind of typical you know, uh, six to seven pound adult cat. Um, it's very, it, it, it's very affordable. Um, obviously I realize that's a relative term. Um, but, uh, again, talk to your compounders about this, depending on obviously the volume that you get and so on and so forth. Um, but it is, uh, it is an affordable option. All right. We're going to talk about dosing and, said low dosing for individual cats. And there's an asterisk there. Um, and you're gonna see that refers to this uh, Romanoli paper down on the bottom um, in, which, in which the author looked at historical uh, uses of this drug uh, at different doses. And, and he kind of classified them low, intermediate, and high dose. So when I'm talking about those things here, that's what I'll be referring to. Um, and when we get into things like side effects later, we'll see that some of the side effects, I think some of our veterinarians in the audience and, and, and some of the other folks too, if they've experienced with this, may associate this with certain side effects and we'll see they tend to come at certain, uh, certain doses. Um, so this dose, you see in the middle, uh, about uh, 0.625 mg per kg, which is uh, approximately two and a half mgs per cat. Um, and when we say, say per cat, adult cat, uh, six to eight pounds-ish. 
um, two and a half megs per cat per week, dose weekly. Um, and so at this dose, um, it's really important, uh, as it says up top, one cat, one dose, one week. We want to make sure we're not giving them uh, too much. And according to what little data you know exists in peer-reviewed publications about this, a maximum of about of about 30 weeks here. Um, a little note at the bottom, some folks very understandably said, okay, what if a cat's already in heat? Because we know that this, this drug is used to to prevent heat, what if they're already there? Um, in in sort of a combination with this low dosing we talked about, uh, Romagnoli refers to uh, a five meg per cat <laughs> dose. I love that, five megs per cat. Um, once a day for three days initially, and then switching to that um, 2.5 meg per week dose that's, that's cited above. All right. So the big question, does this work? Um, it would be a reasonable question to ask, right? As we said, this has been used for decades and decades in, in cats, um, but we, uh, we don't have a lot of hard data on it. There's a lot of reported success, um, you know, people saying that, that, that it worked, but uh, we don't have a ton of uh, hard data on it. One example of a pap paper that did track um, a fair number of cats um, is a pretty old one. And you'll, you'll see, uh, you see that it's their uh, own from 1977. Um, I won't bother reading this, but you can see it's about almost 250 cats. And these were the things that were, that were observed. That's where the 30 weeks comes from. Um, there were two litters uh, that came out of that, uh, that group that you observed. And 21, uh, these cats did show signs of heat. Um, this Romagnoli paper, I'll refer to it again, it's really well referenced and organizes this stuff well. And uh, thankfully, uh, it's, it's available uh, publicly. So you can grab it without any, um, any subscription to one of the, one of the scientific journal uh, databases. Um, all right, so another question we often get is, you know, what about if so-and-so? Um, so male cats, uh, it does not have, you know, any uh, you know, effect for fertility control um, in male cats. And at the, <clears throat> the various side effects that we'll talk about in a second can happen to male cats as well. Those have been seen. Uh, what about kittens? Kittens, um, less than four months. The, again, what little data uh, do exist on this. Um, so to avoid that mainly due to uh, pretty uh, significant uterine changes that we're seeing. So this is not really a tool for those, those, uh, those, young, those young kittens. Um, and lastly, pregnant cats, the, it's certainly something that people uh, want to pay attention to and ask about. Um, there have been reports of stillborn kittens uh, when using this, um, this drug. And there's concerns about um, sort of masculinization of, of kittens, uh, largely because of some observations of that in, in dogs and puppies. Um, one thing to think about, some people have heard about the idea of using this in managed colonies, uh, and that's certainly been uh, you know, done throughout the years. Again, there's, there's little, I would say there's no you know, peer reviewed data on that one. Um, I mentioned, it, you know, we did talk about it in a paper that we put out on this in 2013, um, but the dose that was used there um, was 0.1 to 0.2 megs per keg per cat weekly. And that's referring to a, a dose that was used in a you know, commercially sold marketed product uh, that was available um, up until about 2011. Um, obviously, when folks were doing this, uh, it's really important uh, that they prevent any unequal distribution, right? Because you don't want uh, that big, you know, that big fat Tom or that, you know, <laughs> super food, um, aggressive, tiny little cat to gobble it all up. Uh, so put this here because we know folks are going to ask about it. But again, there's no peer reviewed data here. And of course, if you're dealing with colonies of cats, things like that, the veterinary client patient relationship challenges get uh, all the more complicated. Um, so Lastly, we're going to talk about uh, side effects here. So side effects happen 
of course, on a spectrum. I don't want to sort of imply that there are these discrete points um, uh, in terms of dosing where you see these things. But you can see these, these dosing levels that we've talked about here from micro to, to high dosing. We haven't really talked about high dosing, but it's uh, something that people did in the past. Um, and at these smaller doses, uh, you certainly see increased appetite, weight gain, some hair coat changes. Um, and these are, you know, obviously minus the hair coat changes. Um, pretty common, right? If you see those, it's, it's like a spade cat. You often see those things um, in terms of the weight gain, at least. Uh, as you get higher, um, you start to see transient diabetes. When I say transient, it's uh, been reported that they'll develop diabetes mellitus, and then at uh, cessation of the use of the drug, the uh, diabetes uh, has gone away. It's been reported. Same thing with adrenocortical uh, suppression. Um, as the doses get you know, much higher, then you start to see some of these side effects, mammary tumors, uterine lesions, pyometra, that, that people very understandably are historically uh, quite concerned about. Um, but again, we're certainly not talking about the idea of using a dose that high. Um, so the last thing I want to yeah, talk I, about is, say, oh, sorry. yeah, go ahead. Go okay. Um, I, I was actually going to say, at this point, Mike, um, before you close, I'd like to turn to Michelle for just a minute to see if there's anything oh, sure. she, of that Sherry adrenologist, wanted to add about... Um, about the side effects and safety profile of this? Sure, thanks a lot, Joyce. Uh, uh, this is Michelle Kutzler, and uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak to uh, this group right now. Um, I, I did wanna add a couple uh, additional comments. Uh, as Michael was saying, megastroacetate um, is a synthetic hormone like progesterone, uh, but it's actually 25 times more potent than progesterone, and that potency is relative to how strong the chemical combined to the receptors. Uh, like other progestins, um, megastroacetate also binds to the glucocorticoid receptors in addition to the progesterone receptors, and because it can bind to glucocorticoid receptors, it actually can act like prednisone or other corticosteroids and have potent anti-inflammatory effects in cats. Um, because of this, veterinarians uh, for decades uh, have used megastrol in cats to treat everything from um, endocrine-related alopecia, um, feline acne, uh, psychogenic over grooming, um, flea allergy dermatitis, uh, et cetera. Uh, but again, because of its effect on the um, uh, glucocorticoid uh, receptors, it also has this ability to impair adrenal gland function. And uh, I know that it was just mentioned in passing uh, as a, a transient effect at the low dosages, but according to one study um, by Chastain and coworkers in 1981, uh, megastrol at the low dose uh, can cause significant adrenal gland um, uh, impairment. Uh, and in one cat, which um, it's interesting, I'll just let you know that it was an intact male cat, um, uh, had a severe adrenal gland suppression within one week of treatment of the low dose uh, that ultimately resulted in that cat's death. Uh, so uh, the authors of that study said that cats that are treated with megastroacetate should be monitored for stress. <laughs> and if they are stressed, they might need to be supplemented with glucocorticoids um, because of this adrenal gland suppression that's occurring. Um, again, not to paint everything with gloom and doom, but I think it's important that we know uh, what the possible risks are. Another side effect that wasn't mentioned uh, is a condition in cats that is called mammary fibroadenomatous um, hyperplasia. And uh, this is where you get uh, acute, uh, severe mammary gland enlargement, and it can occur in both male and female cats. Um, following treatment with megastrol, even at low dosages. Um, in a report by Hayden and Johnson in 1986, 
uh, they found that the dose and the duration of therapy um, could not be a predictor for the development of mammary hyperplasia because of individual susceptibilities to um, the mammary gland uh, to progestin administration. Um, I know that this drug is used quite a bit uh, in Europe, and in Europe they also have um, an antidote uh, for this condition if it were to occur, um, but we don't uh, have access to that drug, uh, egliprostone, in the United States, so this would be a, a problematic uh, condition that, um, uh, while uh, reversible, is, is quite dramatic and uh, can uh, require surgery in some cases. And last, and I, uh, Michael did mention this, but I did want to say that um, if megestrol is administered to pregnant cats, uh, inadvertently, of course, um, we, need, we need to know that um, this can result in mummification of the kittens, uh, kittens that are born with birth defects, uh, and it can also result in prolonged pregnancy, resulting in dystocia, so uh, maybe the necessitate the need of a C-section. Uh, and those queens that do uh, deliver may um, not be able to lactate, so those kittens would need to be uh, bottle fed. So just, I want um, uh, us all to be completely aware of some of these other um, potential side effects, uh, maybe uh, not lethal, but certainly we don't want to um, uh, go into this uh, without, without knowing. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. That really brings yeah. the risk benefit equation up. Yeah, thank you. Oh, that's like, that to Mike. Yeah. Th yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. That's like, it's a perfect segue to, uh, you know, really the last thing I want to talk about, which is uh, whenever we talk about this, and, and honestly, any, any sort of new tool we're talking about, I think there's always this elephant in the room to some degree uh, that some of us, myself included, um, can, you know, be fearful. Be, be be worried about um, trying these these things, and I, I can say that as a you know spay neuter vet who um, worked in spay neuter for a number of years, and I still do it uh, uh, sometimes. Uh, I rely on surgery, you know, pretty heavily, but um, always think to myself, man, I hope that there's one day when I say, can you believe we used to anesthetize animals and rip their organs out in order to, in order to render them sterile, um, or even control fertility. And so I think about the use of these things. Um, and as you can see from you know, the, the lack of data on this stuff at a, at large scale, we need more, we need more data because all of the things that, uh, Dr. Cutler just listed, um, are real and are concerning. And we just want to know how often do they happen? And, uh, so on and so forth. And so I always, uh, with myself, try to say, like, can I turn this fear into some hypothesis? Can I, can I test this um, in some way? And I'd like to say that I, I can speak for myself and I think everyone here, no one's trying to convince anybody of, of uh, trying anything here. We're trying to just present all the information that we, we have and let everybody, you know, make up their own, their own minds and to some degree say, hey, is there a hypothesis here and might I want to test it if I have the capacity to do so? So thank you so much. Thank you, Mike. Okay, yeah. we're going to shift to, to Julie. Um, Julie, for those who are interested, could you talk about the practical issues about getting this medication into their hands? How do the concepts of veterinary relationships, telemedicine, and compounding fit in? Oh, sure. And let me just confirm that you can see my slide. Does it? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, so this is complicated. And if you're a veterinarian who is trying to navigate the landscape of the current regulations uh, on a good day, when we're not having a pandemic, you have a lot of late night reading ahead of you. Um, but during a pandemic, when there's a lot of emergency orders and suspensions trying to figure out how we can honor stay at home orders and still serve our patients the best, it's tricky. But I'm gonna just share a little bit of language uh, that you'll need to know when you go to your state to find out what you can do because these things are different in every single state. So the first is what is a 
a VCPR that you'll hear a lot about. That's a veterinary client patient relationship. And that is what is needed in order for a, a, a veterinarian to diagnose and treat a patient. Uh, traditionally, this is required an in-person visit, so cannot be established uh, over telemedicine uh, in the United States. And this is a problem because right now people are not supposed to be making in-person visits except for emergencies. And a lot of, of pet owners do not have a regular veterinarian or their regular veterinarian may be closed. And so um, th that it's, they're just logistically, it's very hard to get care right now. Some states have gone ahead and are waiving that requirement for an in-person visit to establish a VCPR and that they're allowing that to be established virtually. So then the next uh, topic you need to know is what is telemedicine? If we're going to do virtual medicine, what are the, the parameters in which we are allowed to practice? So telemedicine is the practice of medicine using technology to deliver care at a distance where the physician may be at one location and use some kind of electronic method to deliver care at a distant site. You're not actually seeing that animal. It's important to understand that the practice of veterinary medicine includes all of the topics of diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. So you need to be a licensed veterinarian in order to prescribe any um, drugs that require prescriptions such as megacyl astartate. Then finally, what is compounding? Since this drug is not available in a format that we can actually use in cats, it is available in tablets, but they're too big to quarter up into cat-sized doses. So we need to work with our compounding pharmacies to mix up a solution that we can then parse out depending on the weight of the cat. So compounding is the there's the technical definition, the customized manipulation of an approved drug by a veterinarian or by a pharmacist upon a prescription by a veterinarian to meet the needs of a particular patient. So it really is designed to be a one-on-one -on -one exception to normal pharmacy regulations. And that's a challenge when we're talking about mass care, especially in shelters and for community cats. But examples of ways um, that medications are used in compounding is mixing up two medications, like we might in a syringe for an anesthetic injection, making oral suspensions out of tablets, and this is what is most commonly done with uh, megase adding flavoring. So a lot of you are familiar with your cats that you have to get uh, flavors added in order to medicate them or in the development of transdermal gels. So this, this slide is busy for a reason because I tried to sort this out last night and I spent many hours on the AVMA website and other website trying to come up with a um, concise, helpful statement for today about how you would find out what the compounding laws are. And this is a map of the United States that color codes all of the states for um, what their current compounding rules are. And that is pre-pandemic. So the rules may have loosened up in your state somewhat in the pandemic era. But you can see that it, it goes wildly from allowing no compounding to allowing pretty liberal um, compounding. Now there's also two definitions that you need to know about um, something called office stock, which is a bulk container of compounded medication that a compounding pharmacy would deliver to a veterinary practice. And that practice can be a private practice or it can be a practice in a shelter. And uh, that is only for treatment of in-house animals. And those in-house animals could be interpreted to be including the foster animals that still belong to the shelter. They don't belong to private parties, um, but they're being housed off-site. But you cannot take that jug of office stock and put it into a little bottle and then give it to a client, like um, someone, an adopter who is already now owns a pet. And then questionable whether you could also dispense it to the community caregivers that are part of your TNR program. It's a real fuzzy gray area and you are not going to find anyone who is going to go on record telling you how to handle that, unless what they're willing to say is, no, you shouldn't do it, and just ignore those cats. Um, for the rest of the animals, you need to write an individual prescription for that particular pet, call it into the compounding pharmacy, 
and um, it will be delivered to the pet owner or they can pick it up from your practice. But that is very different than having your big jug that you pour into a little jug and then hand out. So this is a challenge for the shelters that have pushed thousands of cats that are unneutered into foster homes right now because in, in practice they would have to write, well, if for at least for the adopted ones that now belong to someone besides the shelter, you would have to write an individual prescription for each animal, have it shipped out. It becomes quite expensive. But this, this varies from every state. So every veterinarian is going to have to do their own research and try and, and find out what they are allowed to do. A lot of people got really excited when they saw this statement from the FDA. It says we will allow veterinarians to prescribe drugs in an extra label manner. Um, without direct examination or making visits uh, to their patients. So this uh, seemed to say that you could use telemedicine to prescribe. However, this really has no impact on the practice of veterinary medicine itself because the state rules are still going to supersede this. So if your state rule is saying that uh, you have to have an in-person visit to establish a VCPR, um, this, this federal rule will have no effect. We wanted to take a moment here, um, uh, folks, just to ask Linda Rhodes if there's anything she would like to add to the Julie's synopsis of this situation. Yeah, hi everybody. Um, Julie's right. This is a complicated, um, a complicated area to, to work in, um, and I think that probably the best source of information about availability is to, if if you are a veterinarian, to call your local compounding pharmacy or one of the larger um, compounding pharmacies and talk to them about the availability of magestrel acetate uh, and also check your state regulation. Um, it is good that the FDA has said that for their part, they're okay with the telemedicine approach, but your state may not agree with that. So uh, I think the, the best way to find out about availability um, is, is to talk directly to your compound, your compound your pharmacy if you're a veterinarian. If you're not a veterinarian, then you need to find a veterinarian who can develop a relationship with a compounding pharmacy to get that information for you. Um, and I think the only other thing I'd like to say is that, you know, in this crazy time when, when we're, we're all trying to do the best we can with what we the risk benefit um, equation changes a little bit uh, because certainly. There are some safety issues with with MA that you know we've highlighted, um, but the the it has to be balanced against the kind of risk right now with having multiple kittens born. So everybody will make that decision for themselves, but um, I think it's appropriate to understand the risk may be a little less now compared to the benefits um, of doing something rather than not spaying. So I would just urge you to think, think about that. And, and I do see a lot of questions in the question box about, um, you know, do we know about this dose under this condition? And the sad thing is because this drug is not FDA approved, we don't know very much about any of these questions. We don't have a big database for effectiveness in different ages of cats, in different stages of reproduction. Um, whatever information that we have, we've tried to put out there um, in terms of uh, peer-reviewed publications, uh, but sadly there's just not enough for us to answer all the questions that we all have. So, Thank you, Linda. Thank you, Linda. That. That's really good advice and I appreciate your perspective on these are not normal times and the risks are different and I, I see a lot of questions about TNR cats, which are probably the ones that we're least equipped to give you really helpful advice on. But it's important to remember too that um, right now, literally most of the cats are pregnant and 50% to 75% of those kittens that are born in the field will die. And that's the normal risk of being a community cat is there's a very high mortality of kittens before adoption. So we have to take that into consideration. It's a huge welfare challenge and we're not blind to it. I did. Um, the only other thing that I'd like to add is I've seen a couple of questions in the chat box about human exposure. Um, MA is a steroid. It's a very potent steroid. You can absorb it through your skin. So when you're handling this, particularly as a liquid, you need to take care to use gloves uh, and make sure that you minimize exposure. Um, so yeah, take take be careful handling it. So um, I did I did want to provide um, this link to. 
uh, telemedicine option that, well, it's telehealth that will be available um, to all shelters for free. Your foster homes can sign up and get 24 seven access to a real veterinarian, discuss their case. They can use FaceTime or whatever and um, show pictures of the animal and get advice. Now this is not yet to the point where they can diagnose and treat, but it's a great triage service. So your foster homes in the middle of the night can talk to a veterinarian who can tell them, is this an emergency or is this not? And can also triage the calls so that your shelter veterinarian um, doesn't have to stay so busy on routine calls. And this is a, um, a Facebook group I just joined because I am um, an un unwilling but <laughs> inductee <laughs> into the world of veterinary telemedicine. So I am trying to learn as quickly as possible. And this is a group of veterinarians who are really enthusiastic about telemedicine and are being very helpful in helping other people navigate this landscape. And then I wanted to finally just wrap up with a, a little bit of a, a story about community cats. And I can see from the chat that this might be the, the biggest concern that people have, um, is that community cats have been treated with magesterol acetate for many years. There was, it became popular in the late two, 2000s um, when it was distributed for weekly treatment of cats at a low dose and, and actually developed quite a positive following. So since then, some folks have figured out how to get this either from the compounding pharmacies or mixing it up themselves. And so I just put out to the listservs kind of a call for um, the stories of people who had been using this and how did it work. And people were all over the place in the doses they were giving and, and the purposes that they had. Most of them were using it um, on colonies that they were trying to do surgery on but it was taking a little while to get all the cats caught and into surgery, or sometimes it was given to the cats that were really hard to trap. Um, but but it wasn't uh, didn't tend to be used as the primary reason, uh, primary strategy for controlling cats. Um, there is a really tricky uh, question here that I don't think we're going to get an answer for: is when you have an unowned animal. Um, that these caregivers do not want to be identified as the owner. They're feeding the cats and trying to bring them in for veterinary care, but they are community owned. And our regulatory environment isn't built to uh, deal with that. So veterinarians who are thinking of supporting community cat caregivers by providing prescriptions for this need to kind of just keep that in mind uh, as they deal with this. So this was just, I'll, I'll wrap up with this final slide, is one community cat case study that I thought was very interesting. It is um, someone who was still managing a very large cat colony in Florida at a big government, uh, dilapidated government housing complex. So there were a lot of alleys and, and places where the cats would hang out. She started managing the colony in 1999. And at the peak, the cat colony had 135 cats. She primarily used TNR and then was adopting out the friendly cats. But when new cats would show up, what she said was a common problem because of abandonment, she would just give them all MA until they could be trapped. So she didn't know if they were males or females, but she made sure they all got treated. And then she would continue to treat the cats that were hard to trap. Now, of course, when you, as Mike mentioned, when you're uh, tre treating a big group of cats, making sure each cat gets its own dose can be troublesome. And she had some strategies about how to do that. She'd mix up a big batch with drug and put it on lots of little paper, uh, lots of plastic plates. She said, don't use paper because it absorbs into the paper. And it, this process worked for her. Um, one, one cat that she specifically remembers was one that she had been, she had been in the colony since it was a kitten. It had nine litters. She was never able to trap it. So she finally learned about MA in 2008, treated this cat for years and had no more litters after that. And this, uh, fortunately, she's been very dogged at this, and the colony is down to 20 cats now. And her comment was the only side effect from this medicine was a positive one. The mom cats start to look healthy. So with that, Joyce, I'll turn it back to you. And I will get Excellent. Thank you, Julie. Um, Mike, would you switch us over to uh, starting up on the research slide? Yes. Do you yes, find yes, that yes. there? Great, thank you. 
So we're going to turn to questions next, but I wanted to just take a minute to talk about how do we learn from this whole ex emergency response. Um, and we are planning a general survey of those who choose to use MA as to how it works in crisis management um, and as an innovative stopgap method for spay delay. Um, and importantly, to learn from your monitoring of the health of the cats in your care. Um, so we hope to survey cats and caretakers separately, and we are hoping to do some kind of more in-depth study with some key partners, especially around those treating multiple cats, that we can really look at the data and health over time. So please do stick around for a short, short closing poll at the end of this, especially if you're considering using MA and would be willing to be surveyed about your experience. So we're going to move to questions now. Um, and I, um, <laughs> or to the elephant in the room. <laughs> or to the elephant in the room again. <laughs> yeah, why don't we switch passes? Because I think um, people have gotten the, yeah, so the next slide there. Um, we're going to move to questions now. I'm sorry we don't have as much time as we had hoped, um, but Mike has been curating the questions in the chat. You can certainly add some now, and sure. we will find up a mechanism of posting um, answers to that. I will sure. also mention that as of today, Mike published a blog um, that you'll be able to get to at the Maddie site that has, uh, it's kind of in a frequently asked questions mode, so that should help. So with that, I'll turn it to Mike to post some questions. And, and Allison, can you tell me, do we have a hard stop at the top of the hour or is there any potential to extend? Yes, we can go a few minutes beyond. Feel free to tag on 15 minutes if everybody has time. That is awesome. And this is, this is Linda. I have, I have been answering a few of these questions in the Q&A uh, list as they come up. So some of those answers are already uh, typed in. There's a couple of places where um, we obviously need Michelle and we need Julie. And so Mike, I'll let you, awesome. I'll let you take sure. over. So what one of the, yeah, this is one that, uh, that keeps coming up in various forms and fashions that uh, Dr. Levy kind of alluded to already. Um, Folks doing uh, TNR and asking, you know, how can I, how can I use this, especially as it relates to um, the idea of working with a vet, a VCPR, that sort of thing, and the challenges therein. Um, I'll, I'll take the first pass at it, and of course, uh, like to get other folks' input too. Um, as with a lot of the answers you've heard here, is talk to your vet about that. All of these things are, I'll say, just sticky, um, hazy issues that need to be handled on a really on a case by case basis. We can't make any, um, you know, blanket statements about what you should do or what you um, shouldn't do. But I think the most important thing is that this uh, this drug needs to be used in cooperation with a veterinarian, and that veterinarian needs to know what you're doing, um, how you're doing it, and so on and so forth. And with that, I'll, I'll see if any of the other panelists want to uh, add to that. All good? Cool. Um, this one, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Kutzler about, can this be given to lactating cats? What if the cat's lactating? It, uh, administering it to lactating cats shouldn't affect lactation at all. Uh, so uh, it, it's unlikely, but occasionally cats do uh, uh, come into heat while they're lactating uh, and um, can ovulate even during this period of time. So we know that under um, natural situations, cats will continue lactating with a high level of progesterone. I guess I should qualify my answer in um, saying that no one's ever looked at administering uh, MA in lactating cats before. Um, I've spent quite a bit of time over the last month reviewing the literature on this topic, and I haven't seen anything uh, about that. Uh, but I could tell you that um, uh, cats with spontaneously occurring high levels of progesterone uh, will lactate uh, without any problems. Great, thank you. Um, so this is another one, and I saw uh, Dr. Kutzler, you'd actually already answered this, I think, in the chat, but just so you could put it out there to everybody. There's a lot of versions of the question um, when 
the drug and when we stop using the drug, you know, presumably when we, you know, spay them or something like that, um, our side effects reversed uh, and it, all different side effects are in here between the, you know, diabetes, adrenocortical suppression, mammary gland changes, uterine changes, et cetera, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I saw your answer, but maybe you could kind of tell everybody what you said. Well, it was I, a very sharp, clear, defined. That's right. You know, the, the answer <laughs> is it depends. <laughs> ah. uh, um, it really depends on on the um, on the side effect that is occurring and uh, the um, the nature of the side effect uh, and the the animal. So, just use an example: uh, mammary hyperplasia. Um, it's not something that uh, we see very commonly in the U.S. because we don't see that many intact female cats, and we're not using uh, progestins in cats very often, uh, but uh, this uh, essentially looks like a terrible mastitis in, in all of the glands. Uh, all of them become acutely, uh, extremely enlarged, and uh, it can result in um, sloughing of the skin and the mammary tissue underneath that. Even if the uh, medication is withdrawn, uh, it takes a while for uh, the mammary gland tissue to um, involute, you know, return to its normal state. And, and in that period of time, if uh, it, start, it started to slough, then it might require surgery or at the minimum antibiotics uh, to prevent uh, additional health problems from occurring. Uh, and I, again, I just pick on that as, as a, um, one particular scenario that I've had some experience with, but uh, you can imagine if a cat does become diabetic, even if it is for um, maybe a month or six weeks after the the condition, after the MA is resolved, that still is a, a additional um, care, uh, uh, cost, and uh, welfare issues that need to be considered for that particular animal. Cool. Thank you. Um, so another question that folks are asking, this is interesting. Um, and maybe, uh, Dr. Levy, in, in, uh, I'll, I'll put this to you since you're organizing some of these uh, incredibly massive spay-neuter efforts. Um, so some folks have asked, okay, so if we use this, when we get back on the, uh, on the spay train, when all this is passed, should we prioritize these cats who, are, uh, who have been treated? Is that you know, what you might consider doing, prioritizing the treated cats if folks choose to do that? yesterday about when we r ramp up to these massive spay neuter catch-up programs what is going to be the priority and of course i was lifting my hand for the tnr cats um, mm -hmm. but someone else was also lifting their hand to say we need to get the backlog of animals that are either in still in shelters or have been put out in homes um, first especially if they're in foster homes and they're kind of waiting to move on to the next step so i i think that there will be um, probably a lot of both of it going on because there's some clinics already that are specialty TNR clinics and they're not going to be doing privately owned animals anyway. Uh, so I, I can't say the answer to that, except that we're really planning to make this an enormous spay neuter push, like nothing that's been ever seen stateside. And it hopefully will have uh, a holdover effect too. So that at the end of this, not only are we caught up, but we have better spay-neuter capacity than we did before the epidemic. Excellent, thank you. Um, Allison, how are we on time? I just wanna make sure, sensitive to that. Oh, it looks like we're just, just past the top two. of the hour. Um, yeah. so we, she had said we could extend uh, questions yes, for up to 15 can. minutes, which is great. I do want people to get a chance to take the poll. Perhaps we do the poll now and then return to questions for those who wanna stick around. It's a great idea. Does that sound like a good plan? And you can look at the questions to, to bring forward. So if you could um, advance the slide ones then. Yep. Yes, so um, this is our second poll. Um, from what you've heard now from the, the Q&A and the presentations, we'd love you to kind of rate how likely you are to use MA in your program. And nobody is being held to this. Um, and then, and you can see that options are definitely probably possibly, probably not, or definitely not. And number two, if you're likely to use this option, would you be interested in participating in a potential field research project? 
if you can you can select yes or no and if you select yes the email address you use to log in will be um, given to us so we can contact you and give you options to participate in a survey or or something deeper so please take a moment to to give us your feedback there and then we'll return to questions All right, so I'll share for those on the recording um, what we're seeing so far. Um, for the definitely category, we're getting 6% of respondents. For probably, we're getting 9%. So a total of 15% and definitely or probably. Possibly uh, 45%, which makes a lot of sense. You need to look into this for your own situation geographically and otherwise. 34% um, are saying probably not and 6% are saying definitely not, kind of a direct parallel to those saying definitely. Um, and I see about 46% of you uh, answered yes as a gestalt, and so we very much appreciate having um, the opportunity to be in touch with you about this to learn from, um, learn from the next steps. Thank you so much. So um, we're going to go back to questions for those of you that want to stay around and, and thank you so much. I'm really glad we have a chance um, to continue this and not have to cut off those of you with burning questions. So, so back to you, Mike, with our, our Q&A. Cool. Um, so there are a few questions that surround the idea of, of sourcing this. Um, people have asked, you know, about, you know, what's available essentially. And they, one of the questions that kind of keeps coming up is, can we get the tablets and crush them up? I think folks have heard about that, stuff like that. Um, again, this drug isn't uh, FDA approved for, for this use in, 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 for use in cats. So you can't call up uh, you know, whoever your supplier is and, and just get a bottle of, of MA for cats. You would have to get this compounded. Um, and so the, the source, again, going through your veterinarian would be a compounding, a compounding pharmacy. Mike, I, th I think part of that question was, could a veterinarian buy the dog pills and, and right, crush so that's, them themselves? And use them, yeah, and, and crush them up. Into a liquid and use them in, the, in, the practice, in their practice. Yeah, and so that's and, ultimately yeah, up to whoever's I, I, doing it. But, to answer that, which is but I'd like, I was going to say, Linda should do <laughs> answer that. that one. Don't do that. <laughs> Please don't do that um, for many don't reasons. Do but. The, the, the biggest one is that um, you really don't know what the stability is. And the compounding pharmacies are required to test the stability and know how long the drug will last in that form and, and how good it will be for how long. And you won't know that. There's a lot of junk in those tablets that don't really belong in an oral formulation. They're very hard to crush. Getting the dose right is going to be tough. Um, and I really don't think it's going to be that expensive to buy the compounding stuff. That And the final thing is that when you dispense to your owner, um, you've got to have a label on it that has some specific legal language. Um, so you'd have to label what you do. It, it, it's just not going to be worth the hassle. So better to get it from a compounder. I just wanted to follow up on that too. Um, as somebody who's you know, just tried on my own to do this, uh, like um, Linda said, the, the tablets don't crush well. Um, you know, partly I think it has to do with the inert ingredients added or the coating. Um, in addition to that, they don't dissolve well either. So uh, I've, so I've put a tablet into a syringe and just let, left it in water all day and it's still the same tablet. Yeah. Um, so uh, I think that trying to get a 2.5 milligram dose out of a 20 milligram tablet, you're gonna end up with dosages all over the place and and then it's not going to be effective or could even be, you know, um, toxic on how much is it. If I can, yeah, if I could add to that, the compounders I've spoken to, this can be provided in a capsule. So the, the MA powder is in a capsule that you could tell a cat or you could open the capsule and put that content onto the food. That tends to come with a longer shelf life than the liquid suspension. So that is an option to talk to your compounder about. They, the compounders are working from a powder. They're not crushing pills and, and going from there. 
Yeah. Again, the, the tricky thing with the capsule is if they could make it in the right dose in like a 2.5 mig dose, that would be terrific. But if they make that's it in That's what I've dose, been told. Yeah. So, yeah. so that would, that, that's a possibility. Yep. Yeah. They said that comes in the smallest, the number four size capsule. Yeah. But again, you have to get that from a compounding pharmacy. It's not something yes. that the veterinarian can buy and try to make for a client. Absolutely. That was from a compounder. Great. Well, unless there are any particular questions that other panelists have seen and want to answer, I think we can leave it at that. And I certainly want to let, uh, first thank everybody for, you know, coming out and uh, spending the hour with us and also let everyone know that the, the recording of this uh, webinar will be available in the next uh, day or so. Um, and we'll, yeah. we'll send that out. So um, yeah. with that, are there any other questions that panelists want to, respond to that they see in the chat box or do they feel good about where we are? I just like to give a plug to the, to the ACC and D website where um, you have a great blog with, let's summarize your frequently asked questions. ACC and D also has a lot of information about this, including the references. Um, and there's also a quite an elaborate uh, position paper on the use of progesterone as a contraceptive in cats and dogs. Um, so if you want to dive deeper into the literature, uh, you can find a lot of resources there. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Thank you, Linda. Well, again, a, a thank you to Maddie's for hosting this. It made it work quite well um, and you turned it around very quickly. Um, and thank you to all of you who will be making really important decisions about how you're going to manage this uh, spay gap in the next hopefully only several months. Um, so thanks again, we will, we will post the, uh, the link for the recorded version of this and um, look forward to hearing from you and learning with you together as we uh, address this pandemic. Thank you so much all for coming. <laughs>